Good morning, everybody. Or uh, maybe we should prep for um, 2018. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Aloha. 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 All right. Oh man, terrible. Did we? Somebody have a party last night? Uh, um, so thank you all. Thank the RoboNation folks for starting at 9 o'clock. That's very civilized. Some of us could have used that extra hour of sleep. Um, so uh, this morning, we're going to um, have two panel discussions. Um, the first one, we're going to talk, uh, both of them kind of involve simulation. Um, the first one, we're going to talk about simulation and the support of development. And the second one, Tom Curtin is going to lead the discussion, and we're going to talk about um, specifically simulation and how it relates to the competition. Um, so we have 90 minutes. Uh, we have one hour and 26 minutes, according to this. And the way we're the format for this is we're gonna um, we have uh, five panelists and we'll um, who have all done wonderful things in simulation. So the first half of our time, we're gonna try to do some dissemination and show some of the great things that our community is doing with simulation and how that can um, how that can help us develop our our uh, our capabilities um, and then for the last half we'll uh, have some discussions so hopefully by then everybody's got some coffee and we're ready to ask some good questions um, so uh, let's see um, the goal of the goal of what we're going to do today is to try to um, raise some awareness for those teams that could use these kinds of tools. I know a lot of teams I've seen over the last two days are using these tools effectively. And uh, what I'm gonna try to get us to think about in the last half is um, what are the things that we could collaborate on? How could we get take advantage of some of the hard work of the people up here who've developed some wonderful tools? How can we make sure that the teams have those so that they can start working on their algorithms and don't have to spend the weeks to develop the simulation themselves? And then what is the sort of low hanging fruit, if you will, in terms of things that we could add to our current capabilities as a community um, to, to be able to be more productive. All right, um, so quick introductions to our, our panel. Um, we have David Battle from here in Sydney from Mission Systems, um, who has a long background with uh, all things autonomous. Um, Raghav Khanna, he, he helped me pronounce it, I probably butchered it, uh, but um, from ETH Zurich. Um, Ian Chen from Open Robotics, uh, Open Source uh, Robotics Foundation, the folks that um, develop and maintain the core of Ross and, and specifically Ian's work in Gazebo. Matthew Dunbabin from uh, Brisbane, from Queensland University, who's uh, actually be, he's between sea cruises right now, so it's, uh, um, he may take some time ashore. And Andrea Munafo from, um, uh, from the UK, from the uh, Oceanographic Center, the National Oceanographic Center in Southampton. So we're going to go in alphabetical order. We're going to do uh, roughly five to ten minutes each to kind of tell you about some of the work that their groups have been doing, and then we'll collect from there. So, David? First of all, thanks uh, to Brian for in inviting us back. Um, I was a judge in 2014 when I worked for the Department of Defence in Australia. Dug this shirt out, which I cherish and uh, occasionally paint the house with. Um, since then, however, um, David Johnson from the Centre for Field Robotics, who is a long-time collaborator of mine, and I, uh, with a mixture of maybe bra bravery and stupidity, threw in our cushy jobs and uh, decided to do a robotics startup in Australia. So that's Mission Systems there. Uh, and we're, you know, obviously a small company and we don't have our own platform. So simulation is quite crucial to us in, in developing things like customised behaviours and whatnot. Uh, so the theme of the presentation this morning really is encapsulated in those first two words, uh, physics-based maritime simulation. So it's really all about getting that simulation as close to reality as possible. Um, I'm, I'm an acoustician with a bit of optics. Uh, Dave Johnson is a radar guy, so we've got most of the spectrum covered there. Okay, so I haven't got a lot of time, uh, so a sprint down memory lane for me. Uh, I learnt maritime robotics on ships uh, bobbing around in the ocean in between trying desperately not to throw up. Okay. Uh, I worked at the time at this, the Centre for Ocean Engineering at MIT with very fine people like Henrik Schmidt, John Leonard, and uh, Mike Benjamin, who was here in the audience this morning, an old shipmate. Um, so, so in a particular trial in uh, 2006, which was part of the PlusNet 
uh, experiment, which I think was funded by Dr. Curtin, who's also here. Uh, simulation uh, really uh, rose in priority for us. Uh, so being in Boston at MIT, uh, really our, our choices for testing underwater vehicles were fairly, fairly limited uh, due to you know, funding constraints and, and whatnot. Uh, we, we did have the Charles River, but anyone who knows the Charles River knows why it's a good idea not to operate underwater vehicles in the Charles River. Uh, so, so I embarked on a lot of simulation uh, before the Monterey Bay 2006 experiment, which involved a, you know, AUVs, multiple surface platforms, towed arrays, and all sorts of technology. Uh, and uh, this has all been done in VRML, uh, which looks great, and it's good for visualization. Uh, but really, uh, I have to say that it's, it's a bit of a facade, okay? It, there was a fairly low level of integration in the simulations that we were doing. We were using Moose at the time. Uh, the dynamics for the underwater vehicles was computed in, in Moose. The dynamics for the towed array was done separately in a MATLAB script that was supplied by really smart guys from Vehicle Control Technologies in Virginia. Uh, the acoustics, which was uh, done by people like Henrik and myself, was done in you know clunky uh, Fortran code that was plugged in sideways into the whole thing, and so basically there was a fairly low level of integration. So moving forward to today, uh, and it is an entirely different situation. You know we have fantastic free software that is available. Uh, <laughs> just by virtue of downloading it, okay? And we have these other fabulous developments, GPUs, you know, driven by gamers. Uh, they're pushing harder for uh, cheap teraflops. So you can do now in real time what used to be done offline. Uh, there are also a collection of very fine libraries like the Bullet Physics Library, uh, OpenCV for machine vision, NVIDIA Optics, Blender, mature middleware such as ROS, Moose, and that uh, little robot, Morsey, down the left-hand side there is really what I'm going to focus on. It's uh, the modular open robot simulator engine, uh, which is a project out of France. Uh, there are the main uh, people responsible for it there. This information is really just copied off the Morse website, uh, so you, know, you can read that at, at your leisure. It's very uh, heavily um, Python-oriented, okay? which is great. Uh, Python's a very flexible, powerful language. Um, but out of the box, if you have a look at the set of default robots that are available, you're looking around there and you're seeing, you know, maybe some quadcopters and ground vehicles. Not really that many maritime vehicles. There is a submarine there and uh, to my horror, when I, when I first looked at Morse, uh, one of the things people were doing was switching off gravity, okay, saying, we're just uh, bobbing around with neutral buoyancy, what do we need gravity for? We switch that off. Don't do that, because uh, gravity is very important, it turns out. <laughs> OK, so uh, when you get into Morse and customise it, as we have over, over the last six months, uh, you can really make things realistic. Uh, so this is a little bit of a simulation of Bluefin 21. And OK, it's nice to look at. It's a bit of eye candy, but it's actually a very sophisticated simulation of that vehicle. Uh, with all of the instruments uh, instantiated, INS, IMU, forward-locking sonar. Uh, it even has a GPU accelerated side scan model which generates about one million rays per ping at 50 hertz. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. Uh, the ocean module is a procedural GLSL texture uh, which can be arranged to have the spectrum corresponding to virtually any sea state. So uh, a very sophisticated simulation. Some of the other vehicles we've been working on, uh, down the lower left there, you've got the Hydromia Vertex from those crazy guys uh, in Hyd Hydromia in uh, EPFL, EPFL uh, Switzerland, Alex Barr and um, Felix Schiller. So we're helping them with some trajectory generation for that vehicle. It's got five thrusters, tiny vehicle, only 70 centi centimetres long. Then you have the deep ray vehicle. Uh, if you're familiar with the Scripps six metre uh, flying wing glider, this is kind of an Australian knockoff, uh, which I uh, started when I was still working for Defence. It's designed though to go much faster than, than the Scripps vehicle and it's rated to 1,500 metres. Uh, then you have a uh, generic rib there, which can be driven autonomously. It's got an articulated outboard with the force vector being applied through the propeller. Um, and 
all of these vehicles really use a distributed buoyancy model, which we've, which we've perfected in uh, mission systems. So essentially, on another layer of the 3D design, you just orient these spheres to represent roughly the distribution of buoyancy and mass. And uh, you have very realistic uh, surface, surface movements for the vehicle, which is crucial if you are interested in things like deployment recovery, OK? So switching off gravity, no, don't do that. Use uh, simulated buoyancy instead. So this is roughly how Morse works. Uh, Blender, the Blender game engine gives you the hooks to get in and run this loop. Uh, so there is a, a main with, which does some system, system level stuff. And then you get time slices essentially for each of the sensors and actuators. And I've got a little bit of example code there in, uh, in Python. So essentially on the left hand side you have this, the actual simulation going on. And the great thing about this is it's pretty much middleware agnostic. So on the right hand side you can put whatever middleware you like. It supports sockets, ROS, YAR, poker libids, poker libs, which I hadn't heard of, uh, Moose of course, uh, HLA and uh, a text mode. Uh, essentially, one side communicates with the other by just sending data through local local data maps. So it's it's very uh, it's kind of a decoupled architecture, uh, and all you really need to implement a middleware is is the bindings. So um, thanks go to Saad at MIT for the absolutely fabulous work that he did on um, Pi Pi Moose, and of course there's there's Pi Ros and all kinds of uh, other other bindings. So just, just quickly to look at how you would implement a dynamic simulation, again looking at the glider. So we have the force diagram there, um, so constant velocity, all of those forces are balanced, okay? In this case, the parameters, the maneuvering parameters, if you like, came from CFD that was done at the Australian Maritime College by Max Haas. Um, and they were fed into the uh, Python code uh, so the nonlinear drags and, and lifts are calculated in real time for a given angle of attack. And then you uh, essentially just stick those uh, values into vectors. And in the Blender game engine, it's simply a case of apply force, apply torque. Uh, it's a very simple API. And uh, when you run the simulation, that, that glider just flies like a glider. And, um, the, the motion is extremely realistic. Uh, we've also implemented things like, um, you know, variable buoyancy trim tanks, and it's really a very sophisticated model. Uh, lastly, um, in, in the way of uh, sensor simulation, uh, what, something we're doing for the Australian Navy uh, to, to help with, uh, perhaps as a training tool for mine countermeasures, is a tool that is a GPU accelerated sonar simulator. So, so on the left-hand side there, you have the simulated uh, virtual Bluefin 21 with a, with a virtual side-scan sonar, and it's running along the bottom in a constant altitude mode. And on the right-hand side there is, is basically the side-scan data that's being spat out in real time. Uh, so as I said, about a, a million uh, rays per ping at 50 hertz there. And all of the you know, beam pattern effects and shadowing is done in real time in optics. And we've shown these images, you know, um, to people who spent their lives looking at side scan and they say, you know, that's getting, that's looking pretty close to the real thing. Uh, so that, that project came out of a collaboration that I started with Sydney University, uh, actually with Dave Johnson as it happens, and, and we're gonna uh, license that technology back from, from the university. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, where I think all of this is headed is in more, more and more uh, realism in simulation. So as we get more computing power, mostly GPU enabled, uh, we're going to be able to get closer to reality, okay? Uh, so s systems like Morse achieve this uh, very high level of integration now. So you've got the physics engine. Uh, we don't have yet have the CFD in real time in the simulation, but maybe, who knows, 20 or 30 years' time, you can design your vehicle, plonk it in the virtual ocean, and it'll just, everything will work. But until then, we're doing CFD offline and, and writing the, the, you know, the algorithms to run. Uh, so, thanks very much. All right, yeah, so in, in alphabetical order, Ian. All right, thanks, Mario. Um, all right, so hi, everyone. My name is Ian. I'm from Open Robotics. Um, 
joined since 2012, and since then I've been working on different aspects of Gazebo, which is a 3D robot simulator that we developed. And another thing is uh, ROS, which you may have heard of. Um, so a little bit about, about me. So I joined 2012, and then I worked on um, my own interests are in visualization, graphics. I also work on sensor simulation. Um, and recently, more and more, I've been doing more cloud and web stuff, which I will show you today as well. And then uh, we have like dedicated physics sites working on the physics engines for Gazebo. Um, I'm just gonna play a few videos in my presentation. So just giving you a brief overview of what Gazebo can do. So it's designed to be a generic uh, robot simulator, not specifically tied to any applications. Um, you can see humanoids, swarms, drones, aerial robotics, and, and other applications. Um, we really rely on the community to take what we offer and extend it and, uh, for their own applications. And hopefully um, one or two of them will contribute back and uh, we can showcase it in our website and stuff. And then all the packages, software that you contribute back, we can release and, um, uh, for other people to use. So everything is open source. Uh, we have a commercially friendly license. And you can see different interaction methods. And the, thing, the other thing that we do a lot is we run uh, competitions with Gazebo. Um, and education, prototyping, um, you see stuff designed in Gazebo can be exported and then uh, laser cut as well. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about Gazebo. And then uh, for those of you who attended Wednesday um, tutorials, you have used the Kingfisher uh, demo on the left side. So kindly put together by Brian. Uh, so uh, you can see that Gazebo can be used for uh, maritime applications, and, but we really rely on users to take what we have extended. Um, and also on the right, this is what we did. We took um, the Kingfisher Gazebo, which was right there, and then we put it on the cloud. So we launched machine instances on Amazon Web Services. Um, when it's running, you can use anything that has a browser, connect to it using um, a WebGL compatible uh, browser, and then you can view it anywhere from the, around the world. There was a live demo uh, on Wednesday where I launched a machine in California, and then I'm here in Sydney controlling and interacting it with uh, in real time. go. Um, the other software that we work on is ROS, uh, Robot Operating System. So the nice thing about using ROS for going back to the theme of this panel for development and design testing here, it offers a common interface for interacting for your code on the left side, your software application to talk to the, your robot in virtual simulation. And then you can, after you do your development, the same code that you tested in simulation because everything is going through a common messaging interface. That's the same code you deploy onto the real robot. Um, there will be discrepancies, of course, between simulation and the real world. Uh, but I believe if you dedicate enough time to create realistic simulation, it will be worthwhile in the long run. And that's what we did for um, one of the competitions that we ran before, the NASA Space Robotics Challenge, which has ended in June this year. So just wanted to share this email that we got back. Uh, so uh, Kevin from Team Coordinated, he participated in the competition and then he won. Uh, it's a one-man team, pretty impressive. So um, so everything is done on the cloud in Gazebo. So he did all the tasks by himself. Um, he spent a month doing it and we spent like a year creating simulation for everyone. And so he took this and then uh, he, won, he won the grand prize, and then he was asked to port his software onto the real robot. And then he shared with us, I'm just gonna read it out, um, the process of getting the software running on the real robot for the first time and completing the task with perception was done in one day. I thought that was a great testament to how well Gazebo was working. So I thought that's really great news, because he didn't have to, I, he would need to tune gains, PID controls and stuff, but the core of his software just worked. So on the right, he sent us a video but this is just a screenshot of this is the robot uh, operating uh, this control panel to orient the satellite dish and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's all I have. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Awesome. Uh, thank you. My name is Matt Dunbabin. I'm from the Queensland University of Technology. Uh, a bit of background about myself. I'm a field roboticist, um, primarily focused on marine, so uh, autonomous surface and underwater vehicles for coastal domain applications. Um, so the Great Barrier Reef Robby tonight, um, doing different types of testing. But what I wanted to do is give a bit of reflection on the role. We've started using simulation a lot more um, but the role of simulation, particularly for the uh, Robot X competition, because I think a bit of a nice story here um, that might show some of the power that you can achieve with simulation and modelling. Um, so this is our boat in Hawaii, and the reason why I'm showing you this little part, so those are familiar with the tasks. I think, um, I can't remember if this is the finals or qualifying, but we had to detect a, um, a light sequence and it will fast forward here so it's detected light sequence and then it goes to the dock. Now, uh, yesterday Kelly mentioned the importance of getting actual sea time um, and getting out in the water. Well, we were quite fortunate enough to get a lot of sea time but we couldn't afford these types of elements, the docks and things like that. We just literally could not assemble them or, for, um, or put them where we, we've been doing our testing. And so my colleagues here in the audience are Peter Smith and Leo Sinassis. Um, Literally, Peter wrote a simulator, which I'll go to in a second, but on the flight over from Brisbane to Hawaii, uh, Leo wrote the um, docking code, the path plan docking code, implemented it first time at Robot X, and it worked a treat, first time out of the box, right? So the power of simulation there meant that we could actually, um, you know, take something that well, we couldn't physically test, but obviously we were able to, to do well. And I, was it even tweaked after you? Where's Leo? Okay. Yeah, was it even tweaked after you did it on the plane? Uh, that docking code? So I didn't tweak it too much. No, so like, just the power of it. So, um, oops. Yeah, so I just sort of wanted to just say, before I go into that model, um, there's a couple of other modeling tools that, yes, you can have these realistic simulators and that type of thing, but I just wanted to sort of mention a couple of other things where we have been using different types of tools. SolidWorks are very powerful when you're doing your design work. Um, our underwater vehicle that we have there, you can just see the CAD and the virtual one. Great for just sort of that prototyping, getting the buoyancy, the, the centre of gravities and that type of thing right. Um, we've mentioned ROS. Um, I just wanted to bring up that a lot of people do use MATLAB and there's a really nice MATLAB to ROS bridge. If you haven't used it before, it makes life... If, if you need to actually write a bit of MATLAB code, like you want to do a model predictive controller or something and you don't want to convert that across, just run it in <laughs> MATLAB use a bridge and you've suddenly got this really nice um, uh, way of, of sort of testing it, either hardware in the loop or, or real code. Um, so those that were at um, Peter's talk yesterday would have seen a more comprehensive talk on his um, simulator. So Peter, as part of his final year thesis, um, he, he's an IT guy, was a game developer. Um, but one of the big things for us, and particularly for this type of challenge, is the ability to do visual, um, uh, so yeah, camera-based um, autonomy, um, vision-based uh, uh, processing. But also, if you have different types of sensors that currently aren't in Kazebo, for example, a high-fidelity Velodyne, for those that were lucky enough to have one for 2016. Um, so Peter went around trying to do a very realistic, or as realistic as we can get it now, um, seen um, and interactive model uh, where you can have high fidelity images, you can, we can do reflections, we can do all sorts of things, we can degrade the environment just to help not only test the vision algorithms but also set up different types of courses and this, and Peter has it on his laptop, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to show you uh, in real time this simulator. So it was very powerful, um, I think from 2016 I think it, pr it definitely proved its worth and for 2018, uh, one thing it didn't have at the moment, and something that for those that have been in Hawaii, we need to add wind. Um, so that's currently being added. Um, uh, and I can't remember what other modifications, but um, yeah, it, it's a really powerful tool and we can create different scenes, different courses. Uh, so we had the course set up uh, in, the, in the model. Um, some of the key areas uh, where you know, when Peter was developing this system, um, the ability to do good sensor reconstruction. So one of the things we didn't want to do is have a, 
a program where you actually have to compile in a simulation mode and then transfer across. You want to actually have real code that is either running on the robot using these sensor feeds or um, uh, yeah or doing it all in simulation. And a couple of the key things, he did a really good realistic um, model of a Velodyne um, to replicate the, this, the scanning process so you can get very good fidelity models. Um, that was just our test site in Brisbane, just to, to do some validation there. Um, just some different scene scenarios, yes. Even though the simulation model is nice eye candy, but just trying to get a bit of that similarity between the real image and the, the fake image. Um, now, can you get some sort of similarity down to the point where you know he's including the um, flaring due to um, to the sun, that type of thing. So it's all important, particularly if you're doing vision-based um, uh, processing, uh, just having some way to try and break your code um, in a realistic manner is, is nice. And so where are we going from here? Well, we literally have a commercial project at the moment where we're developing in a small underwater vehicle for a reef, uh, literally where I'll be tonight. Um, and so Peter's taken it to the next level. He's done a different framework, and I think he's going to rework the, the WAMV simulator into this framework, uh, where it is a, has a physics engine, we have an underwater vehicle, and again, it's around vision. So I think it's simulating two stereo camera pairs in real time um, with, with uh, you know, all the obstacle avoidance, collision detection, everything. So, you know, it's a, it's a really powerful tool. So you can use this stuff, and this is vitally important because we don't want to lose our vehicles obviously in the water. We want to accelerate testing time, run a very tight time frame. So we're able to get most of the bugs out of the code before we even hit the field. So I'm going to leave it at that and thank you. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I, uh, so my name is Raghav Khanna, and I'm from the Autonomous Systems Lab at ETH Zurich. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers, Kelly, Brian, um, Cherry, Janelle, Juliana, for uh, having me here and organizing everything, and uh, it's been great. Thanks. So um, after hearing uh, all of these nice talks uh, about how to do simulation and, and how realistic it can be, uh, my talk is uh, focused on rotors, which is a UAV simulator, so for flying vehicles primarily. Uh, but what I want to uh, present to you is how we use it in our like development workflow. And uh, some of the lessons, I think, are directly transferable to other teams. I think uh, one of uh, our colleagues from NUS was asking me, uh, you know, the the problem with, or the big question with simulation is, is it useful? So I think after my talk, I hope that I can answer this question. Um, yeah. So uh, where did it come from? Uh, so rotors actually came from uh, the European Robotics Challenges, which our lab was organizing. And uh, it was actually uh, for the simulation contest. Uh, so the idea was, uh, I think, very similar to what uh, <clears throat> Kelly uh, and uh, the robot, robot nation people are thinking of is um, that you want to have a virtual competition uh, as the first stage, and then uh, the teams that do well in the virtual competition uh, are provided technical and financial support for the next stages. So if you can reduce the number of teams from like 30 or 20 to 10 or 15. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so what are, uh, what's, what's uh, rotors, what are the main highlights? Uh, so it's based on ROS. So as people have mentioned, it's very important to have the same code running in simulation and on the real platform. Uh, it's open source, so, and by now it has a fairly large community uh, and lots of active development work going on. Uh, so Rotors provides this, the capability to simulate forces and moments uh, acting on a single rotor. Um, and uh, forces, like the gravitational force acting on the center of mass. So uh, it's easy to include new platforms. So you can go from quadcopters to hexacopters to octacopters and even fixed wing vehicles, uh, along with, uh, since it's gazebo based, the ability to uh, simulate sensors and uh, actuators. So many platforms are already available with a baseline controller and state estimator. Uh, it supports advanced physics engines, uh, which enable accurate contact simulation, uh, which I'll show examples of uh, in, uh, in the next slides. Uh, and uh, it allows uh, both hardware in the loop and software in the loop simulation. Uh, 
so one of the examples is the px4 community is actively using this. Um, so I won't go too much into the software architecture other than saying that it's modularly organized into six packages. Uh, and new platforms can easily use most of the overlapping functionality from the current platforms. Uh, and having used it for over three years, um, I'm definitely quite impressed uh, with the design decisions that uh, the initial uh, development team made. And they have really uh, stood the test of time. Um, so uh, now I'd like to show you uh, some of the projects where uh, Rotors has been successfully used to significantly reduce uh, the time and cost associated with uh, novel algorithms and functionality. So uh, the video on the left uh, shows uh, the rotor simulation, and, uh, which was used for development and testing. Uh, and the videos on the right uh, shows the same thing happening on the real robot. Um, yeah, so this is a kind of a funny project which we did uh, in collaboration with some um, um, forest, uh, with, a, with the forest forest scientists. And uh, it's basically using an MAV to inspect uh, a woodpecker hole. So it's using a, uh, an end effector attached to the MAV, uh, which has a small camera and a, a light source attached to it to detect the hole and, and, uh, and kind of insert the camera into the hole. So uh, this involves a lot of interacting components, right? Such as uh, like the tree trunk and hole detector, full body MAV control uh, with, the, with the end effector. And uh, using rotors uh, made it, I would say, much easier or, or definitely kind of uh, cheaper to debug all these interactions. So um, here, the simulator is used uh, thanks to the NICE physics engine to understand the contact interaction between the MAV uh, with a manipulator and a rigid wall, uh, which is used for uh, developing the full body control strategies uh, for industrial inspection. So if you want to clean windows with a UAV or um, I don't know, grind something at a, very, at, a, at a big height, then you need to understand the forces and the interactions. And rather than writing free body diagrams, you can, we can actually say that we can un understand them much more realistically using this simulation. So yeah, this is a project I'm personally involved with. And uh, here we are trying to slalom through the forest by giving only high level waypoints. So we just tell it to go on the other side of the forest. And uh, the model predictive controller actually ensures collision-free paths. And I don't even want to think about how many crashes we might have had if we didn't try this first in simulation. So yeah, so now some um, case studies uh, where uh, rotors played a pivotal role in uh, development of novel functionality. So this is uh, showing collaborative transportation of large and heavy objects uh, using multiple uh, vehicles. So two MAVs transport an object that neither could lift alone. And uh, the front MAV is controlled by uh, like a user in, the, in a position control mode. So it's very easy to fly. And uh, the second one is autonomously maintaining an altitude while following uh, the forces that are acting on it. So uh, that's, that's uh, something new that was developed uh, and first in simulation and then in the real world. Um, so it also played an important role uh, in, the de in the design and development of uh, our entry into the MBZIRC Robotics Challenge, uh, where we placed second overall. Um, so these videos show uh, the simulation and the real run for Challenge 3, where the MAV is supposed to detect uh, moving or stationary objects and pick them up and put them in a defined box. So uh, Rotors was used to implement and test like complex functionality, like the, the detection of the, of the vehicles, but also uh, fault tolerant behavior. Like what happens if you drop an object in the middle? So I think uh, the video on the right uh, will show uh, this kind of functionality where it's uh, the, the moving object is, like, it's trying to pick up the moving object, but uh, since it's a magnetic gripper, uh, it fails, but we had implemented the logic to kind of uh, account for this situation. So it, uh, since it's the, the, the object is still in the field of view, it goes back and, and actually picks it up again. So this allows us, since, since the goal was to put as many objects in the bo box uh, as possible in, in a given time, uh, it actually helped us quite a bit. Um, Finally, uh, earlier this year, uh, a team of 10 third-year undergraduate students uh, developed this uh, omnidirectional hexacopter. Uh, it has six additional tilting motors uh, uh, for the propellers. 
And uh, during the first part of the project, they created a rotors version of their platform. So this is a testament of how easy it is to actually create. Uh, so it basically account, uh, amounted to creating a URDF model of, of uh, the, the, the robot. So yeah. And I think that's about it. But before signing off, since it's the holidays, I'd uh, like to send you this special message, message from our team in Zurich. Good morning to um, everyone, and yeah, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a pleasure uh, uh, being able to present some of the things we're doing and, and, and to see some of the results that also other groups are, um, are, are doing. So after uh, the, first, the first presentations where we focus a little bit more on the marine, time, on the marine environment, we moved to the aerial space, and then we go back to the marit maritime environment, because I work in the National Oceanography Center. And, um, and what we do is a little bit in between marine science and robotics. And most of the development that you do in robotics is actually driven by requirements coming from um, ocean science. And that also implies all the simulation requirements that we have do come from the fact that we want to explore specific, um, specific environments. Um, that also means that some of the things that I'm going to present with, um, in this presentation are slightly different from the scenarios that you usually um, uh, that you've usually uh, seen. Um, yeah, so this slide shows some of the missions that we um, that we um, that we usually run. The, the the video that is now playing on the left um, of of the slide um, that's uh, one of our. Um, I want to say a routine mission when we deploy an, an autonomous and water vehicle to do long-term um, and, and long endurance um, long endurance mission under ice, um, and and you can imagine why this is challenging. Um, 
first of all, is because once the vehicle is off for hundreds of kilometers off the ice uh, under the ice shelf, there's no way for an operator to actually have a feeling of what's going on with the vehicle. So the vehicle itself needs to rely only on its um, on its capabilities. Um, and, and another thing is that the environment itself is rather than known because until the robots actually dare to explore it, we have very little information on how that environment looks like. Um, the second video that is now playing in the middle of the slide, that's another um, mission that we tend to run quite often. That's about the exploration of underwater canyons. And underwater canyons, uh, in this specific case, the robots were doing uh, multi-beam surveys. And underwater canyons are rather um, complex and challenging environments for AUVs because uh, the environment itself is, is very is very complex and very and very difficult. Um, usually, there's very high water current, uh, and so the robot finds itself operating in very stressful, I want to say, um, uh, I want to say conditions. Uh, and finally, the picture to the right that shows one of the uh, new missions that we are aiming at doing uh, with our newest underwater robots that can stay in the water for months at a time. Uh, then, in that case, you can think of even doing something that is as complex as crossing the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and in this case, the uh, problems that you face, you can, you can imagine the problems that you face, you know, you range from the fact that you need to come up with new way of navigating underwater uh, because 90% of the Arctic Ocean is covered by ice, uh, to the fact that you really need to be sure of the robot that you deploy um, because there's no way, you know, to get it, to get it back otherwise. Um, and these are some of the data that we collect when we do our missions. We start from the, um, if we start from the left side of this, of this slide, that's a, that's a multi-beam uh, image that um, our vehicle collected uh, flying at about uh, 80 meters off the sea bottom in 2008. Uh, then three years later, we had to do a similar mission, but this time flying at 40 me meters off the bottom to collect side scan, uh, side scan data. Uh, then three years after that, uh, we were tasked with a different uh, with a different mission where the vehicle had to fly at two meters off the off the bottom because scientists wanted to take now uh, pictures of the uh, of, of whatever there was on the sea bottom. So this is also to show how whenever people get accustomed to what you can do with robots, then they keep on asking more and more from the robot themselves, and the environment in which the robots find itself operating becomes more complex because from from in the left side of this slide, then the robot is rather far away from everything else, right? So um, it's, a kind of, it's in a kind of a safe environment. But then when we move to the right, and that happened only you know, in, a, in, a, in a few years, then the robot's now flying at two meters off the bottom. And so the, the, the awareness that it has to have and, and its resilience needs to, needs, to, um, needs to increase. That also means that whenever you deploy the vehicle, you need to be more sure of the performance that you can get out of it. And this is why having a simulation environment can really help that development because you can test uh, all, the, all, all your chain of, of events. Um, beforehand. Um, so um, and this slide is just to give you a, a rough overview. I think m most of the people here have already described um, most of the elements that, uh, that I'm presenting in this, um, in this slide. But this is to say uh, I, I, there are two points that I want to make with this, with this one. The first one is that, of course, we can embed our uh, AUVs together with a, with a, with a, a simulation environment. And we are, I, can, I can really um, you know, describe um, most of the details that on, on our simulation environment because we're leveraging on, on commercial products at the moment. Um, and hopefully, however, our aim is actually that uh, to open it up to everyone else so that you know, more people can use it, uh, etc. Um, we're partnered with Thales for this specific for this specific case, uh, but one of the things we are really interested in is actually to make sure that we can have a representation of the environments um, where the robots are operating in. At NOC, we are in a very um, um, peculiar position because we have both. Uh, aspects. So we have the robotic component and the oceanographic component. And I'm playing here the top right pictures is um, one of the output of one of the oceanographic model that we run at NOC. Um, in this specific case, it's showing the um, surface uh, water, water current. And one of the ambitions that we have is actually to plug that uh, models back into our simulation environment so that we can use all that information together with the rest of the system that we are, um, that we are simulating. Um, yeah, so, and 
I want to just finish again stressing a few points that I hope I made during, during the presentation. Uh, for us, simulation is quite critical because of the specific environments in which we find ourselves operating in. The fact that we want to run long endurance mission with limited um, control on the robot means that we really need to rely on uh, you know, testing all the components of the robots before the deployment, especially when we think of the fact that sometimes our missions are only a one-of-a-kind kind of mission, right? So we need to make sure that we collect the data in the best possible way uh, before actually um, going and doing, and, and doing the mission. And the second part is about, again, we, we are really hoping to close the loop between the fact that we have robotic simulation with all the physics, with all the details that we are usually use when we, talk, when we think about robotics together with the environmental uh, models that we are running and the data that the robots can collect so that we can kind of uh, loop and improve the uh, simulation and then the performance that we can get out of the robots um, in the field. Uh, yeah, and I think that's pretty much it. So um, I wanted to say thank you to our panel. Thank you all for being brief. I know it's hard to sit up here, and um, but uh, you know, as an academic, sometimes people aren't brief, and I appreciate that. Um, so uh, so we're right on time. We're about halfway through, and now we want to open it up to questions. I have some questions for this group that uh, maybe I can get things started. But we really want to hear, especially from the students in the room, um, and so. So I'm gonna maybe um, at the risk of at the risk of putting words in people's mouths. I can imagine there's all this constellation of wonderful tools. We have stuff in Morse. We have stuff in Gazebo. We have stuff coming from the oceanographic community. We have completely from scratch uh, wonderful project in OpenGL. Um, and then we have teams. We've heard from teams from um, especially um, some of the teams that have really hard time with access to the water. You know, uh, the team's in Singapore. I talked to a gentleman from Taiwan who's trying to get access to be able to do the testing. And what I've heard is that there's a real, they've noticed, the leadership has noticed a correlation between teams that are on the water and or have access to the simulations. Um, so what would you tell uh, a team that came to you right after this and said, yeah, we want to compete in 2018. We have a hard time getting access to the water. Where do they start? There's this huge constellations. Where do they where do they go to find something that they can get working by the end of the day, right, Mike? <laughs> and, you, and Wayne's going to tell you to talk into the mic. Yeah, I'm looking at you. I know. I was just... Hello? Yep. Um, so obviously, we've got the gazebo toolbox. At the moment, I don't think there's a WAM V modeled at this stage. Uh, not that I can tell. It's probably out there in the community. Yep. So, I think Gazebo is probably the quickest start. Um, but in terms of the competition, I think uh, in our case, Peter took the lead and realized that you know, his, his skill set in game programming was vital to um, developing a model because we just weren't getting the time that we wanted. We had scheduling conflicts um, in Australia. Our academic year starts in February. Um, but as soon as academic year starts, you've got zero time until the holidays before you can actually do stuff. Um, and during that time, I think you can do a lot of getting the code done. And how do you get started from that? Um, well, in Peter's case, he wrote the, the code from scratch. I'm hoping he might make it open source. <laughs> uh, but I think it's going to go through another refinement. But I think in just terms of Kazebo, just you did the workshop the other day. I think it just shows how powerful and how quickly you can get up environments just doing the testing because I think... Um, you're just getting the, the even the general path planning, nutting out, you know, the the general architecture of your software. It can be just done so quickly in this environment. Um, you know, you don't need to have a super high fidelity model. You can just create a dock. You can even have you know a couple of buoys um, just to be able to do that and have your robot avoid those obstacles. Just in software, it will it will shave off in those first couple of days at the competition. You know, a lot of stress and a lot of a lot of effort. Sure. Um, I, I should mention that uh, from the 2014 competition, uh, specifically the uh, team from the Maritime College in Tasmania, uh, I think they did a lot of work on characterising the manoeuvring 
uh, coefficients for the WAM V. Right. Uh, and I think that is where I would start with a model. Uh, you know, and I suspect if you contacted the team there, they would be happy to. In, in fact, I think they published uh, that data in the journal paper that was presented in 2014. So that'd be a right. good place to start if you're looking for a dynamic model. Yeah, that's when one, one of the things I was coming all the way to Sydney for was to try to get both a visual model and the folks at Emory Riddle, I just have a wonderful SolidWorks model now to try to get that into any simulation environment. And then also the dynamic model, I hadn't been aware that the one from Tasmania, but I know the folks from Florida had done some, some just on the water characterization to get some of the hydrodynamics, just simple, um, you know, but fairly complete. And especially in terms of the, the, my understanding from Robot X is that the thrusters are different. So everybody has different thrusters. So that might be a, a lack of a commonality. So on, on a similar note, um, maybe from the panelists, what would be for Robot X, for those of you who know what's in that competition, you know, we've seen a lot of wonderful tools. What's, where's the low-hanging fruit? What are we missing that could impact the teams? Or maybe the teams can tell us, you know, hey, we've got some great, wonderfully brilliant people up here that are, uh, that are Janelle, you're raising your hand. So what what do Hello? the teams oh, what do the teams need? Yeah, uh, no. not necessarily about the teams, but we do have Musa who is watching live on YouTube oh, right good. now, and she wanted you to perhaps share some more information about the Gazebo Ross plugin package that she's been working on. I think you sure you may have so, spoken. Yeah, about if uh, Alan's back there, he has a there's a, one more video. Um, so uh, Musa. Man, uh, she's. Uh, I've. I've asked her to help me with her name. And um, Musa Marcuso, I think, is uh, is one way to to link those together. But so um, the folks at Bosch for the European Challenge. Um, so Musa couldn't be here because they've moved on to a different project. Um, but uh, they've written papers about this. It's all open source. We used some of their textures for the um, for the stuff you saw with the little kingfisher. Um, Luis put that together for us, and um, in this video, I'll just let it play. Um, we were going to try, you know, I think this is some wonderful work that's completely open source, um, mainly focused on the underwater environment, but uh, um, they had sonar models, so um, I think we were talking yesterday about the underwater component of the competition is, beginna, is becoming more important. And I think so the stuff that David's been working on with, you know, being able to, and, and also Matthew with the vision part under if that's oh man that's hard to get into a simulation and to get it in there accurately so that the so that the algorithms can be transported to the to the um, water environment yeah does any what time is it in germany right now thank you musa for being awake she also says we have a simple surface vehicle model as well awesome yeah, so, so some of these, so one of the things that um, I personally ran into, and maybe David from, you know, from, and from, uh, from the UK, in dealing with what we do on the more field robotic side, um, you know, we're in, in some of these platforms, a lot of the software that's available is specifically for laboratory robots. And when we start talking about, you saw a picture of a Doppler velocity log, a multi-beam sonar, the side scan sonar, are there, are there things that the teams are using that we don't have good models for? Yeah, Mike. Uh, separate question. We have oh. To, do you want to let that one go first? Yeah. Are, yeah. Are, there, are there pieces that we don't have to make the teams successful? That's my question to the panel and to the group. Well, maybe, it, maybe, maybe uh, the question I had was yeah. related to that. It seems that... Um, uh, one question, I guess, maybe for Gazebo is, uh, um, would it make sense, or why are we not just providing WAMV models in like a whole Robot X Hawaii course, including the buoys and everything, just to all the participants, so that they can just not? I mean, it must be fun to make models in Gazebo, but do we really want every team to develop all those same models over and over and over again, or can we somehow find support so that the Gazebo team can just do that? I think that would be great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, so we love creating models. We have a lot of experience creating different models. It probably is going to be the first time we actually get into maritime robotics for a lot of the developers here. Um, but if we can organize something, have some funding or something, we can create these models for all of you. And then we have people dedicated to work on, like, for example, um, uh, thank 
we integrated a lot of work from the users, especially we're well aware of the UV simulator that, um, that's being shown right now. Uh, we actually took their ocean model and integrated in Gazebo, so we look out for resources out there and then we put our own expertise into it and create uh, the worlds and simulations for you guys. That's what we actually do for a lot of our other projects and competitions. Yeah, so um, I'm so so I'm willing to help. So the, the, a lot of this is driven by the community. So and I, you know receiving help from the community of you know if people have hydrodynamic coefficients, if people have CAD models, we can you know we can. I think the great thing about working with open robotics is they will make it professional. I can write crummy, crappy C++ code, and then Luis will, you know, will make it actually look nice. So, uh, so we have some, we do have some support for that. Um, and I think the next panel will talk about how to formalize that, but it's, it's, it's sorely needed. Um, so if anybody has good pieces, yeah, Peter. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, yeah. You're asking about limitations of the uh, current simulation environments, and um, we used uh, Gazebo in both the 2014-2016 competitions. In 2016, I think the biggest limitation we had was the Velodyne simulation. So there are two ways I know of to do a Velodyne simulation. One is to basically do a giant block laser that does 360 degrees. The second one is to actually have a motor function that spins a fairly standard LiDAR, and both of them had quite serious drawbacks in there. So I do actually have an idea for how to fix this. I might see if I can grab Ian later on and have a, a little word. Um, but yeah, I think if that, that, that simulation, be, especially if we keep on using um, uh, very dominant LiDAR, Veldine type systems in future competitions, I think if we could have a simulated um, sensor that uh, not only um, gives the same sort of number of point cloud, but also uh, implement some of the ways that point cloud's generated. Uh, that could uh, allow us to actually improve our uh, object tracking classification systems in the simulation environment. Okay, thank you. And so, oh, go ahead. Ian. Oh, yeah, it's, it's not the first time we, um, people come to us and say, oh, we need a Valdine model. Um, a lot of people need it, obviously, not just in this community, uh, in cars as well. So. Um, but there are a lot of projects that we do, it really limits the stuff we work on. So um, if there's a need for it, um, we should definitely work together and contribute those back and we'll host in our official repository and then everyone can use the official version. So just a small comment to that. Um, so what we learned from, I mean, because we simulate Velodynes and, and all of that, and what we do is uh, we use a proxy. So we just use the ground truth and, and um, kind of bind, binderize or, or voxelize it into a point cloud, right? Uh, the, so uh, as far as I know, uh, Gazebo is fairly limited right now in the fidelity of the, the perception side. So um, it might not, if it's not possible to actually simulate a Velodyne, uh, and if you actually have a Velodyne on the real robot or you have a Velodyne lying around, you can actually, uh, for the perception part, what you can do is just get real data uh, for your tracker, right? And it doesn't have to be on the boat, right? It can just be in front of something that you want to track. And once, uh, what we learned was for, for like all the object detectors, for example, that were on the flying robots, uh, these were made with real data, but just with a handheld camera. Right? And then they translate uh, directly because then you use the actual sensor that you put on the vehicle. Right? Uh, because so simulating that uh, will is coming through and like there are more and more, uh, like as, as we have more and more computational power, it becomes possible. Uh, but even if it is not possible right now, uh, you can use the simulator uh, kind of for the logic, design, uh, control, path planning. And uh, the way to do perception for now uh, the, just getting raw like sensor data from an actual uh, scenario uh, by a handheld, you know, or, or a cart or something very simple, not necessarily on the board, uh, becomes uh, like, because is enough to train at least the trackers and and whatnot. So so yeah, because the point is to go to the real robot as quickly as possible. So simulation should just be a, a stepping stone to that. Yeah, and I think you should go. Um, see this gentleman here with the microphone and convince him to port his Velodyne uh, simulator into something that can be used in Morse and in Gazebo and you know and you might have to talk to his boss too I don't know but <laughs> yeah go ahead 
Um, so when I was creating my simulator for the robotics challenge, one of the difficulties I had was um, getting the mesh of the WAMV model and then determining the volume of displaced water on an uneven water surface. Um, so uh, David Battle, you, you seem to have a, um, a model of, of doing this. Um, how, how do you go about determining the amount of displaced volume of water on an uneven ocean surface? And is that open source? Software? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, so the model we have is pretty flexible, and it's it's just a little uh, Python class that um, it, it looks at your, your mesh model, and it looks at the hidden layer with the distribution of spheres. And uh, essentially, it um, you can set the trim of the vehicle, OK, to, to any height. But essentially, those spheres just represent empty volumes and, and correspond to buoyancy force. So you play with a little bit, so you distribute the spheres um, where the buoyancy should be, and uh, really that it just it just works. There's nothing, no, no configuration beyond that. Uh, and as for that being open source, I you know, I think we're 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 thinking along the lines of maybe contributing that back into the Morse code base because Morse, out of the box, as I said at the moment, is a little weak in maritime, but I think we can fix that pretty quickly, pretty quickly. Um, I think we'll probably end up contributing that to the code base. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that that would be valuable. I I found as a like when I do uh, the, the simulator, I'm more on the graphics side. So when I get to the physics representation, that was the difficult part for me. Yeah, and especially the um, uh, did you find that did you use, use the bullet physics library in, in your presentation? Did you find that the uh, um, the dampening forces, the linear and angular forces, were they realistic in water scenarios or did you have to create your own kind of dampening? That's a really good question. Uh, so, so the bullet integration into the Blender game engine is, is fairly complete and you have uh, sliders and you can set the uh, linear and angular damping. So if it doesn't look right, you fiddle with the slider and make it look right. Um, if you want to be more accurate than that, then you, you really need to code the damping forces in Python. Uh, so there are a couple of options there. You know, you can, you can switch off the default damping and add the damping uh, in the form of um, forces in your Python. So there, there are two, two options. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I, have a, I have a question from Musa from Germany. Uh, so I'm actually not texting my wife up here. Um, so um, she's, it's midnight there. She's had some coffee. So uh, um, I'm sure it's a little chillier than it is in Sydney. So, so for Ian Chin, she asks, um, is there plans to integrate Hydra X um, to Gazebo, which is a, a wave field model? Um, and as they did with Sky X, which I'm not familiar, that would improve the scenarios in Gazebo for underwater environments. Uh, yeah, I'm aware of SkyX and HydraX. These are um, things that the Ogre community, Ogre is the uh, open source graphics rendering engine that we're using. And then they created beautiful um, water simulation uh, on the graphics side, no physics. Um, for those projects, so we took SkyX, which helped us render the sky and clouds and um, uh, something else, I don't remember. Um, but for Hydra X, this ocean, um, w as far as we know, they are not maintaining it anymore. So it may take a bit of effort just to find out if it still works. And then if it works, we're happy to, to integrate it. But obviously, we need time and to spend. And support. Yeah, support, yeah Ian's too nice to say that, but and support. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's one of the things I've observed about working in this just for the past six months is that we're, I feel like we're trying to bridge the gap between the general purpose robotics community. And we all know about all the autonomous car vehicle. You know, these people are moving fast. And there's some great tools that are coming out of that. And But we need to link up, I think, as you said, Peter, people who know about hydrodynamics. So we can, we can leverage the millions of dollars in investment in these tools. And then we can leverage it for our community. And uh, one, I, I don't see them here, but one group that um, we should be talking to is Navitech from Hawaii and from the East Coast. So they have their naval architects. They do hydrodynamic simulations, both CFD sort of full on to panel methods and strip methods for the Navy. And they have offered to have run their physics engine and plug that into Gazebo or plug that into Morse so to, to be able to open open what they're doing so that 
you could take, you know, that would be one of the holy grails here is if you have an accurate CAD model and you can put that right into the simulation and you don't need to know about the physics, it just, it just works. Yeah. Um, so that, um, I, I, we'll, we'll get them involved in the conversation. Um, and on the sort of topic of the wave field, I mean, so that might be something that um, the folks at the Oceanographic Center would be, you know, I've noticed that there's the, it looks right, it, you know, the stuff that the um, Tessendorf does for the Titanic movies and things like that. But um, how do we get things that are actually representative of the environments we care about, especially something like Hawaii, where it's small wind chop? Is that something that we could feasibly get in? So... Yeah, sorry. Okay, so um, one of the things, one of the things that at NOC we're interested in is actually um, to use the models that we run for uh, oceanographic reasons to have them into the into the um, robotic simulation. Right now, the thing is um, for the applications that we have, it's we're talking about hundreds of kilometers with robot exploring long distances. Um, so that's also the kinds of resolution that usually ocean models uh, provide. Um, if you want to go, you know, to uh, smaller ranges, smaller resolution, then you need to uh, go to higher uh, resolution ocean models as well. Um, and uh, but I, but I think it'll it'll be a matter of both a matter of time because ocean models are always improving in the in the way um, they are um, they are they are uh, progressing. And um, one other thing that is probably worth mentioning is is the fact that. Um, having feedback from the robotic community in the way in which what's important for us to make things work better uh, is also an, uh, um, an added value for them to then come up with models that actually might fit what the applications uh, require, right? So I think there's a two-way conversation that, 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 right. that we can have. Yeah, and the, on that note, the, the list, I, you know, the Velodyne, getting the Velodyne sensor in, I think is, it sounds, I didn't realize that uh, that was so well supported in this community, having that piece into whatever we can um, help the students do and the uh, environment, you know, wind, some, you know, simple wave fields. And then it sounds like the acoustic piece is also going to be of increasing importance in the competition. And again, these are different disparate communities. Like when I talk to the acousticians, no, uh, I don't mean any harm here, but, uh, you know, unless we have the full bathymetry to the centimeter level and we're doing the Henrik, you know, full on computational model, it's just not worth doing. But I think for our community, there might be some, sim some simple models that would run in real time that we could integrate into these tools. It sounds like you may have already done that. Well, yeah. So, uh, in the acoustics, there's the low frequency stuff, which is hard. I would say is a little bit harder, and the high frequency stuff is is much easier. You know, that's that's the sort of ray tracing stuff that we're looking at. So yeah, much the layman can understand. Yeah, straight rays. Yeah, somewhat straight. Yeah, <laughs> straight. I mean, yeah, yeah. Are there other things that the uh, so you know again we we might be able to get these people to work on these hard problems for you? Are there other things that the community would like to see in terms of things that? Uh, yeah, over here. So this might be a more general question, but are there specific processes um, you guys implement for validation purposes? Because oftentimes, you know, the question was asked, how useful is, is simulation? Well, to a certain extent, it's how, how realistic is, the, is that simulation, and you have to go through a validation process to see that. So is there any feedback or ideas on, on validation processes for, for simulations? I mean, um, I think from what he showed that, I mean, one of the easiest ways to validate it is, is when you test it on the real thing, right? And if it works the first time, that means your simulation is pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what we observed as, uh, as well. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I guess. So from our perspective, um, we always like to get into the water as quick as possible. And there's a few cup, a couple of quick tests. If you don't have the coefficients that other people might be able to share, there's a couple of quick tests you can just do. And then and that's how we tuned um, some of the damping forces and the, and the maximum speed and stuff that we had for our WAMV. Some from simple tests, linear coefficients, that type of thing. We can get very good uh, models. And uh, particularly if you're developing new sensor models that may go under, like for example, the Velodyne and the camera, um, there's metrics that you can use, that, and Peter's published those um, in, there's a journal paper, I think, as part of this mm -hmm. forum. Uh, feel free to see that. And you can sort of see, you know, that's the type of fidelity that we're after. 
Um, you might not ever get it perfect, and you might not necessarily need to be absolutely perfect down to the millimetre, but if you can get within 10%, uh, sorry, within 80, 90% of the general performance, I think you're going to get a, lot, a long way down the track in terms of the ability to do tasks and, and get your autonomy engine running. Uh, I'd just like to add that um, I think, you know, in a perfect world, you would have some kind of system ID uh, capability along with your simulator. Uh, that's certainly something that we would implement down the track. Um, and I had a chat with Mike about this last night, actually. The V&V &V is, a, is a harder one, you know, uh, particularly when it comes to autonomous behaviours. How do you do V&V? &V? Uh, perhaps the kind of simulation that we've talked about this morning is not is not the tool for that. I think V and V may require a different tool set. So I'll just make one comment. Uh, it makes a wonderful student thesis <laughs> to take the, take the data from simulation, take the data from a real world test and do a comparison. It makes a really elegant, you know, I think anyway, and it's a pretty straightforward path to a, to a master's thesis or an undergraduate thesis. So if you have, how many, how many students are in your lab? Mike? All right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry. So, um, with I've uh, my team has actually been trying uh simulation for both underwater and uh, surface vessel, and uh, uh, there are we realize that there are two actually also for self driving as well. So, uh, there are two big components that that affect how good your simulators will be. One is your sensors. The other one will be really the physics environment. I think the physics was. Uh, well addressed and uh, we're definitely going to be trying to UUV simulator in Gazebo. Uh, but in terms of uh, sensor simulation, we realize that, that um, there's a lot of limitations that comes with uh, regards to what we've been doing. And uh, one big issue is in camera simulation. Uh, firstly, the, the actual image you get looks really more like a graph. It's more graphical, you know. It's not, it's not a res um, well, actually a good representation of what happens in real life. And you'll probably be running different kinds of algorithms to process uh, what you see in real life. I think what Peter did and what QT did with uh, the actual simulation of light and the sun really, really helps a lot. And it would be great if we could eventually see this in a gazebo and made open source. Yeah. So, but, but other than that, I would say this, this really making it realistic uh, for camera, camera uh, vision testing, that's, that would be one of the issues that we face in using it. Uh, the other things with uh, on-surface uh, tasks, um, uh, Velodyne was raised. Uh, we've actually tried uh, Velodyne, and I, I think the ground one uh, actually works quite well. But when when it's used in a maritime environment, uh, Velodyne lasers get absorbed by my water surfaces. I'm not sure whether he was uh, referring to the same issue, and uh, different, issue. different issue. Yeah. So so we realized that even uh, when we use it in gazebo, it appears as though there's a reflection of the surface, and and, and that's really very weird. When you come, when you look at the maritime environment, because it usually get, all gets absorbed by la uh, by the lasers, yeah. But for ground vehicles, it works perfectly fine for the velocity laser. Uh, the other area we had lots of issue with was with radars, yeah. So ground ra ground radars, Delphi radars. Uh, it's there's no very good open source plugin that we managed to find, and the uh, radar plugin is not very used. Uh, I mean, it's not is we're not very sure how we can actually create our own radar plugins if we could contribute back. Yeah, that's that's an area that we thought could uh could help with. There was some insight into this. Uh, marine radars. Uh, I think some of the teams here use marine radars. There will be another dimension of problem because I don't think it works the same way as a uh, ground self-driving radar. That's also an area uh, that that I I uh, thought that could actually have good inputs. And lastly, for the underwater domain, uh, uh I think I saw multi-beam sonars, but multi-beam sonars are three D. Uh, how about imaging sonars? We're not sure. That that would be something that uh, would really uh, help 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 us out in our testing. Yeah, thank you. Um, can I just make another comment just on your vision stuff? I think one of the important things, and we're starting to look at this now, is particularly knowing how Hawaii is with visibility, adding underwater visibility constraints and the attenuation of light due to so actually putting in that whole light model is important um, if you're just doing raw vision without any external strobing or light. So that's something we are looking at for, for our current project, yeah. Just a small comment to that. Uh, so what people have started using for 
driving self driving cars and also aerial vehicles is uh, is game engines right they already spend a lot of effort and 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 money on developing these really photorealistic game engines uh, and actually something that just came out from microsoft research is called airsim and uh, they, it's based on i think uh, the unreal engine Unreal Engine, and uh, so we had recently a project where uh, a deep learning uh, object detection uh, module was trained, like with nine, uh, like ninety percent of the data from simulation, ten percent of the data from the real world, which was labeled by humans, because simulation data is basically free, right? Uh, almost, uh, if you have that engine running, yeah. So it like the students spend one month setting up that that game engine, then generating all that data, uh, and uh, like with only ten percent of the, the the data set which was actually labeled real data we were able to uh, transfer that that module to to a real robot so uh, that that shows that like at least for for vision uh, the graphics are good enough for for the others I mean there's a lot of uh, I think um, uh, gaps and for every sensor you need you need to kind of model it and simulate it and I, I don't even know if kind of uh, it's maybe my question to you. Like, is gazebo kind of hitting its limits there, or? Hello. Yeah. So, uh, we use Ogre, open uh, source robot. Uh, sorry, open source graphics rendering engine. We know a lot of people have been asking us, like, uh, can you interface gazebo with Unreal, or can you interface gazebo with Unity? Because obviously. There's a big company working just on graphics, and then they are used to create these forty million dollar triple A games, right? And then we have four or five people working on you know, Gazebo. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I would say um, the graphics part is, um, is it's a capable engine. Um, you just have to spend a lot of time making it work for your application. So, for example, recently we've been working on a project with NASA Ames. Um, and they re want really photorealistic images of the robot on the moon. Uh, so we added lens flare, we added um, uh, better looking shadows, and then we did stuff to like draw wheel tracks as the ro uh, robot navigates in the terrain. So we're using high fidelity terrain. So it takes time. And um, I th it just takes a lot of people coming together and then writing those shaders. You have to spend time writing those shaders. What the nice thing about these big uh, game engines provide you is that a lot of shaders are there. There are thousands of shaders for you to use and available. But for us, we have to write them ourselves. Yeah, and so, I mean, it sounds like that, that you know, one path is, you know, there's a set of things that Gazebo does well or that Morse does well, but then there's a set of things that require that infrastructure for specifically for vision. And, you know, and maybe maybe there's uh, there's probably not one tool, right? You probably need to, ha you know, I would I would for me, what I would recommend my students to do is start with something like Gazebo or Morse where there's really good documentation. It's very accessible. It's all open and, you know, get the basics working and then you know, just for training the vision piece of it, you know, if you can, because that's a, that's a harder, a harder leap for, um, for, for us mortals that are trying to do these things. Mike, did you have, yeah. Yeah, um, so in, in 2014, uh, I'm not sure what the, the other teams did, but um, we found ourselves, uh, you know, going out to the store and making these big white sheets and making markers on it to sort of replicate the markers we were expecting to see. Uh, we built our own light buoy. We mocked up a dock uh, to practice docking. If we can do that all in, you know, gazebo for 2018, that, that's great. Um, uh, I'm skeptical it's going to work 100%. I think I can get us, like, most of the way there. But there's still, I, I have this hunch that sometime this summer I'm going to be building a light buoy again because we threw out the previous one because it broke and whatever. Uh, we're going to be building those same markers again. We're probably going to be mocking up some sort of dock again. I'm guessing that most teams are probably going to do something similar. I'd be curious to know if teams didn't do that and, and were successful because we felt like it was necessary. Um, so you still so getting back to my first question, you're looking at a lot of work that has nothing to do with innovation of marine autonomy and science. It's just grunt work that each team is doing over and over and over again. Is there any way to facilitate that? Like let's take the light buoy for example. Can we make a design for that and like a, a parts list so that people, if they wanted to build it, um, that you can just go off and buy these parts and assemble it, uh, all the way up to the Gold Star solution where Robot X, you know, buys a few of these things and sends them out to teams to, for loaners for like weeks here and there. Um, 
So for example, like the floating docks in Hawaii, I mean, are those Robot X or RoboNation property docks that are sitting in a storehouse, uh, warehouse somewhere right now, and can they be borrowed by teams uh, for a week uh, here and there so they can practice docking? Um, you know, th those are things that I'm, I'm kind of curious about, uh, just in case, you know, simulation doesn't do it all. I think we should be practicing with robots in the water, in the real world, before we get to Hawaii. So I don't know, um, and they may have just scurried out of the room when you started down that path, but uh, I don't see anybody that's back there that is going to chime in and say yes or no to that. Are there any team, teams here that were in 2016, and, and is it common for people to build their own docks and light buoys? And, yeah. and, and, <laughs> and, and, who, and who did that? Did you enjoy doing that? Are you just going to reuse what you had in 2016? Or? Yeah. So, yeah. Can, I'd just like to make a comment. Mike, um, I think for the vision stuff, so the light buoy the, um, and some of those targets, we ended up making those. But we physically could not make a dock. The, our agreement, we just could not transport. We could not put anything on this particular water storage. So that's why we ended up doing the simulation for probably the more hardcore physical stuff that would be picked up by a LIDAR that didn't require the vision side. So we had to do a mix there. I don't think we'll be able to build a dock for... Right, the underwater thing is another example. Yeah. Please, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I just want to uh, say a little a caution a little bit. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's all part of learning, and so I, you don't want to throw that out uh, or even with simulations. So if you have something done uh, by you know, professionals, you, you want to utilize it, but there should be some element of learning that the students bring to that aspect as well, not just the, you know, so the grunt work shouldn't all be thrown out. I think that's what I'm saying is that part of it is, is, is part of the learning. Yep. Um, so I just wanted to chime in on whether like building actual props that, that uh, comment was just before. Um, so when I was in the competition, uh, so we had the boat in the water um, and it, we were testing some systems with it and I was back in the tent on my laptop writing the docking uh, algorithms using just a simulator and then we'd go out and test it later. So I think if you get a high enough fidelity s simulation, then uh, you could just, um, you can do pretty much there and prepare your team um, for the competition. Also, when you have a simulator, you can do things that you can't do in real life. For example, uh, if you've got a simulator, you can pause time um, and debug your algorithms. Whereas if you're in the real world, you, you can't just pause time and stop your algorithms because the boat might just careen off into, the, into a dock. And uh, that, that's certainly um, something you don't want to happen. So uh, simulators, uh, yeah, eventually you'll have to test in the real world, but you can you can get more from a simulator than you can uh, in the real world at times, in, and that can be quite valuable in testing your algorithms as well. But and and I think so. My perception of this is that it's a really it's a really good teach teaching environment to be able to know when to do which part. You know, when do you need to go to the trouble of going to the dam to do that testing, and when is the simulator? You know, that is a subtle thing that we've lots of us have learned through failures. <laughs> and so if we can, you know, if we can learn those things um, of when to use which tool, right, that's a, that's a kind of systems level thing. Um, I would offer, and, and I'll try to form this as a question for the panel, we're going to stop in three minutes, but um, somebody smarter than me, uh, I paraphrased them, they said, if your algorithms work in the field, they should work in simulation. If it doesn't work in simulation, it probably won't work in the field. But the thing that's not true is that if it works in simulation, you have no idea whether it'll work in the real world, right? And we've heard some great success stories that maybe by tweaking some gains, but I think that's, that is, um, that's the, I think that's the best we can do. So I guess my question to the panel is, do you think there is any utility at all in trying to get to the point where if it works in simulation, we know it'll, you know, 
I came, I came from uh, the University of Missouri, and if the University of Missouri had a team, they're not going to go to the ocean. Um, you know, could they develop it completely in simulation and then have any success at the actual competition in Hawaii? Uh, I, again, I was speaking to Mike Benjamin last night, and uh, we were thinking back to some uh, famous statements that I heard uh, when, when I started to do simulation at MIT. Somebody uh, said, you know, the thing about simulation is you're doomed to succeed. And actually, we found out... Rod Brooks said that? <laughs> okay. I, I actually thought that was John, but anyway. Uh, so we found out pretty quickly that that's not the case. Um, the better your simulation becomes, uh, the more you start to fail. Okay, your simulations fail, and they start to fail for reasons you didn't think of. And immediately that happens, you're saving money right there. Okay, the second uh, quote is from Henrik Schmidt. Okay, uh, and I think he was famous for saying that for every hour in the water that he spent, he spent what was it, a hundred, a thousand in simulation. Okay, so, so if that's what uh, Henrik says, that's good enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's if I can add yeah, a very brief, very brief, very brief, a very brief comment, I don't think there's. Um, I mean, at some point you have to deploy your vehicles in the water and get the data that that you need. Um, at the same time, I think that the simulation also offers another advantage that is, after you've done your deployment, you go back to the office, and then you rerun the mission and verify how the vehicle behaved in a simulation environment, and then you can come up with better solution. So I think, I think again, there's several layers in which you can use a simulation environment, and you can come up with better algorithm, better, and, and better solution for, for the robot. But I agree with the, with the quote about, you know, for every hour of, of deployment, you should have as many hours as possible of simulation. Yeah, Matt. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I think it's vital to be in the field, because it's a classic thing, you don't know what you don't know. And yes, you can, you've, Based on your previous history of field work, you've done it, you've simulated it, it works, and then you go out and suddenly it starts raining, right? And it's something you haven't considered. It's a totally or the, the wind comes up. Yeah, yeah the wind. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah and, and and that's all new knowledge that you wouldn't have gained if you didn't go out in the field. But then you can actually build up the fidelity of your model, and and, and work on that in the future. So I think it's vital to do both. Yeah, Roger. So, it's just a meta comment to that. You know, if we actually reach that point, would we actually need to have the real competition? You know? <laughs> you wouldn't, right? Well, so yeah, so I actually, so I was uh, making a list um, of, uh, you know, why we need simulation, you know, and I, I started ma listing all these bad things about doing field work, you know, that it's, you know, it's hot, it's windy, stuff breaks, it's expensive, you get seasick. But then my last point, it's really fun. So, hell yeah, we need to go out and, you know, why you, you're not going to get to go to Hawaii otherwise. <laughs> Simulation is just a tool to get you to the field as soon as possible. Yes, I agree. All right. Well, the timer says zero. Uh, let's thank our panelists. Thank you all for your time. And thank you, uh, Musa, for being online. And uh, it's bedtime there. So appreciate it.